Good morning. Guys, last week we kicked off a teaching series called Picture Perfect Family. So that's what we're talking about today. And whether you are a parent, like we're going to specifically deal with parenting today, or you just have a child somewhere in your life, your grandfather, your grandmother, you are an aunt, you're an uncle, you uh, volunteer with kids, uh, you see kids from time to time, uh, I'm going to do my best to uh, talk about things that are applicable to all of us. I'll warn you right from the start uh, that at the end today, I'm going to close with a really heavy story. And so you, if you have uh, older children, I'm not talking about children who are like two years old and they would never understand, but you have a little, uh, some older children with you, uh, it'd be probably a great time, especially then, to uh, maybe go into the lobby or if you want to bring them to any of our kids' programs, uh, you can do that. Uh, and then finally, we're going to be drinking from a fire hydrant today. Right? This is one of those weeks where I just packed a whole bunch of stuff into here because I've seen your kids and I'm like, these parents need help. Uh, so, so there you go. When, when I was uh, growing up, one of my favorite games in the world to play was Pictionary. Right? And if you've never played it, it's a game designed to fracture families and, and build lifelong insecurity in you, especially when it comes to drawing. Right? And, and what happens is you divide uh, everybody up into teams, and then uh, when it's your team's turn, someone picks a card, they have to draw the word on the card and get the team to guess it. They can't do charades, uh, they can't use their words, they've got to get you to guess it. So just for fun, we're going to play a little Pictionary, and you know I'm using easy words today, all right? So uh, what would this uh, be here? Oh yeah, all right, I'm, I'm starting off well. This next word, we're going to go a little harder each time, right? This next word, it took uh, uh, an earlier service more time to uh, figure out, and I blame it on them. I will not say it has anything to do with my drawing. Oh, yeah, shark, all right. Very, very good. All right, this next one, now, if you've played Pictionary before, you should know what this means. Two words, all right, here we go. Campfire, there we go. Well, well done. All right, so here's the deal. If we were playing Pictionary in this series, Picture perfect family, what would you draw for the picture perfect family? Now, now my guess is most of us would draw a traditional, uh, that's uh, supposed to be a guy. Um, that's, uh, there we go, sorry. Uh, most of us, I uh, should have just left it, right? Uh, would draw a traditional uh, family with, you know, your mom, your dad, and your two, maybe 2.5 kids, right? That's, that's what we would draw because that's the picture that comes to our mind. The problem is, only 18% of families in the United States look like this. 18%. Now, when I read that statistic, I'm like, there's no way. There's just no way only 18% are a mom and a dad and their biological kids. But sure enough, went to different sources. I'm like, that's, that's legit. In 2004, this word family has all types of connotations. Right? We got traditional family. We got blended families. We got foster families. We've got Um, adopted families, right? Uh, Families that adopt, single parent families, multi-generational families with a bunch of generations living together. We got boomerang families where you thought your kid was gone, now they've returned home, right? Families, they come in all different shapes and sizes. And so as you can imagine, it is a challenge for me today to stand up here and talk about families because all types of dynamics at play. And it would be really, really challenging if you were the person drawing and you we're forced to draw the actual image that comes to your mind when you think of your father. Maybe you've never met your father and you're like, how do I draw that, right? Or you're forced to draw the actual picture that comes to your mind when you think of your stepfather or your mother or your grandmother or your aunt or your uncle um, because there's a lot of baggage that often comes with those words and in some cases, they're very triggering words, which is why in our culture, we tend to mock family. We tend to downplay it. We tend to dismiss it, whether it's in TV shows or movies or social media, right? We just kind of, this whole idea of families just all over the map and it it can be very triggering. But I want to remind you right from the start today, family is God's idea, right? God's the one who came up with this idea of family. In fact, in the first book of our Bible, the book of Genesis, we read about how God created the world. He created the stars and the planets, created oceans and mountains, created human beings. And after he created human beings, here's uh, what would happen. We read this. Then God blessed them. He blessed these humans and said, be fruitful and multiply. Now, we typically are not good at obeying the commands of God, but that one, whoo, we have done really, really well. Right? We have been breeding like rabbits. We have been building and creating and growing families from the beginning of time. 
And when it comes to family, all of our families are different, right? Different backgrounds, different traditions, different cultures, uh, just different ways of operating. But just to get us all on the same page, there are two things that all of our families have in common, right? The first is this, we didn't get to choose our family. We didn't get to choose it, right? Imagine if we would have had a choice. Option A, they're healthy, they're emotionally stable, they're attractive, they love God, they've got a good support system, good structure, they're intelligent, they're athletic, and they live in Medina, Washington. <laughs> Option B, the dad is a serial killer, the mom is a pathological liar, they live in a bus with 15 cats outside of Wenatchee, Washington. You get to choose, right? There's a lot of things in life that we get to choose, but we do not get to choose our family. Second thing we all have in common is we all come from a dysfunctional family. All of us do. Now, obviously, there's different levels of dysfunction, and I don't want to dismiss or downplay uh, if you came from a family that you're like, man, it was all kinds of crazy. But here's the deal. When you put two or more people together with different personalities, different backgrounds, different ways of thinking, different generations, often different worldviews, it's going to be chaotic. And internally, we all know there really is no picture-perfect family. And yet, when we go on social media and we see someone in their family at some vacation or some resort, you know, um, and they're all laughing or they're smiling, and they're all wearing uh, you know, clothes out of some magazine that's like, man, they spent a lot of money on those clothes. Like, it's hard not to believe that they're picture-perfect. We're like, eh, I come from an okay family, but nothing like theirs. And it's not just because of social media that we, we feel this way. Right? This has been going on for a long time. Uh, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, and uh, we didn't have social media, but everyone still found their, uh, a way to make their families look really good to everybody else. So when our parents wanted to get a family picture, what would happen? Mama would call the photography studio and set up an appointment, and then we'd all get dressed, and we'd get in a vehicle, and we'd drive to the appointment. So in my particular family, we'd call up Olin Mills Photography Studio. Remember these things? You say I'm in malls, but whether it was Olin Mills or JCPenney or Sears, the, the call would be made, the appointment, and then on the day of the appointment, we're all getting ready and we're all fighting. All the kids are fighting, right? It's just like, why do I gotta wear this? I, don't, I never have to wear a tie. Why do I have to wear a tie? This itches. Uh, I already know what I look like. Why do I need a picture to know what I look like, right? All of the arguments, and, but we, we'd get in the car and we'd go, and, and then all of a sudden, the, the picture would be taken and we were all smiling at the moment of the fit picture. Right, so this is the family I grew up in. Eventually, there were seven of us. My parents didn't stop here. Uh, if you're wondering which one I am, I'm right behind my mother. There I am, all right? <laughs> the problem with the picture is it only captures a moment in time. It doesn't capture the addiction. It doesn't capture the mental health, the ADHD, the special needs, the insecurity, the verbal abuse, the affair, the crippling debt, the marriage problems, the temper tantrums, the strong personality. It doesn't capture any of that. And I'm not exaggerating when I say all of us come from some sort of dysfunctional family. Yes, the levels of dysfunction are different, but all of that is, uh, we, we all come from some, some sort of brokenness, which is why it's dangerous to compare what you don't know about someone else's family to what you do know about your own family. I don't care how picture perfect someone else's family appears. I promise you, they're creepy and they're kooky, mysterious and spooky. They're all together ooky, right? Every family has a little bit of Adam's family in them and, and we all have different types of dysfunction, which is why if you miss a lot of what I say today, you can't miss this. There is not a one size fits all approach to parenting. And the temptation is for me to stand up here and say, if you do A plus B, you're gonna equal C. That's just not the way life works. Yet, a lot of followers of Jesus believe that. They say, well, if you do this and this, well, you're going to have godly kids. And so there's a devastating parenting myth that so many parents have bought into that goes like this. A godly home guarantees godly kids. Not true. I know plenty of parents who follow Jesus. They pray for their kids. They model good character in front of them. But for some reason, they go on to make independent choices that are not exactly what their parents taught them. And what ends up happening is then those of us who are parents, we feel lots of guilt. But I'm telling you, nowhere in the scriptures do we ever read that, a, that, that we can guarantee godly kids or a certain type of behavior if we just parent them a certain way. It's not theologically or biblically accurate to believe that. 
Now, the reason so many followers of Jesus buy into that is because of a verse that was alluded to in our child dedication today. And I'm gonna read it from a different translation, but here, here's what it says. It says, direct your children onto the right path and when they are older, they will not leave it. That is a great verse. But that verse is found in the book of Proverbs. This is a proverb, not a promise. Proverbs are statements about how life generally works, right? So most of the time when you do this, here's what you can expect, but not all the time. And all you have to do is read through the ancient scriptures to understand that our environment doesn't always determine the outcome. Right, the very first family we read about in the book of Genesis starts with Adam and Eve in a perfect environment called the Garden of Eden. God would interact with them, would speak with them. It's just this crazy story. And yet Adam and Eve chose to live in disobedience to God. A perfect environment did not produce perfect results. And then Adam and Eve, they have children, multiple children. One of their sons ends up killing another one of their sons. Dateline episode in the very first family. And then we come across a guy named Abraham. Throughout history, one of the most famous people. Everybody loves Abraham. Jews love Abraham. Muslims love Abraham. Christians love Abraham. Abraham ends up having two sons by two different women. And it results in a whole lot of baby mama drama. And then Abraham's grandsons, Esau and Jacob, grow up hating each other, jealous of each other, despising each other. Then we read about a guy named David, second king of Israel. He's referred to in the scriptures as a man after God's own heart. Terrible father. Matter of fact, a conflict between him and one of his sons ends up resulting in a civil war. In addition to that, David had a side chick who was the wife of another man. David strategized on how to kill that man. Another Dateline episode. There's not a single family in all the scriptures that didn't have drama. And so this idea that a godly home or a certain environment always produces godly kids is a devastating myth and it ignores the reality of free will. So let me free you as parents. Here we go. As parents, all we can do is our best. The rest is out of our hands. Well, when my kids were growing up, there was an addiction that was overtaking my life. Listen, in the midst of the addiction, all you can do is your best. And my guess is most of us as parents, we did our best. Yeah, we should have done better. We should have got more help. We should have went to therapy. We should have done all that. But as parents, all we can do is our best. I, I've yet to meet one parent of adult children who doesn't regret some of their parenting from when their kids were growing up. We wish we would have spent more time with them. We wish we wouldn't have smothered them. We, we wish we'd have had more rules. We wish we'd have had less rules. We wish we would have cared more about their grades. We wish we would have you know, had less concern about their grades. My parents did an amazing job. Exhibit A. <laughs> I have said this before. I feel like I won the parent lottery. I really do. A few weeks ago, I had them on stage. I talked about how my dad in particular redirected the course of the family tree. My mom was a follower of Jesus. She certainly had a huge impact on him. But like, I brought them on stage, honored them. My parents send me a card afterwards just saying, thank you, it was such an honoring weekend. We were so proud, love what you're doing. And then they said, and, and we can think of a lot of things we did wrong as parents. And, uh, and, and it wasn't like this deep guilt she had, but she was saying, hey, I, I do wish we could have done some things. Every parent feels that way. All we can do is our best. The rest is out of our hands. That being said, there is a frustrating truth that every parent, grandparent, aunt, uncle must somehow embrace at some point, and that is we can't control our kids. Well, you can control them when they're young. Oh, yeah? You ever tried to get your baby to stop crying? You can't. You obviously have more control when they're young and, and it just every year gets less and less control. But at the end of the day, we really don't have control. We can try, but we don't. This is important. When I, when I first started giving parenting talks, I was a student pastor and I didn't have any kids of my own. So I, I was a great parent. Right? Without kids, I was a great parent. And I would get up and I would give talks like 10 principles for raising godly kids. If you parents with kids would just listen to me without kids, oh, you know, and then I had my first child and I started giving talks on seven suggestions for raising good kids. <laughs> and then I had my second daughter and I said, here we go, five ideas that might be helpful to parents. <laughs> and then Jaden comes along and it's like three tips for surviving parenthood, <laughs> right? We can't force our kids to do anything. We don't have control. It's a frustrating truth, but let me give you something encouraging. And that is we can influence our kids. 
And the younger they are, the more we can influence them, right? Every year we lose a little bit of influence, but we can influence them. We can influence their faith and how they view God. We can influence their character. We can influence uh, how they handle conflict. We can influence how they navigate relationships. We can't control them, but we can influence them. And this is why 3,000 years ago, Moses calls the children of Israel, the people of Israel together, and he says, hey, here are the boundaries, here are the rules, here are the laws that we have to operate by as a society, as a people group. This is how God wants us to uh, live. And, and as he's talking to them, he, he then kind of switches over and starts talking very directly to parents. He says, and parents, you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you are on the road, when you're going to bed and when you are getting up. And then he gets extreme. He says, tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Ancient Jews made it their responsibility, not the primary responsibility of the priest. It was their primary responsibility to teach their children about the ways of God. So they would remind their, God, uh, their, their children of God's faithfulness throughout their, their history as a people group. They would encourage their kids to honor God. They would teach them how to pray. They would do their best to influence their kids. Now, how we influence our kids is going to be different based on each kid. It's going to be based on their temperament, their personality, no doubt about that. And, and the good news with, with children, they can be grown children and you can still influence them, right? My parents still influence me today. They probably wish they had more influence on me, but it is what it is, right? But they, 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 they can influence me even as adult. You can influence your children as adults. But the three supplies that every parent, every grandparent, every aunt, every uncle, everyone involved in the life of a child needs to, uh, to take with them is what we're gonna unpack today. Uh, the first is this. They need to carry a watch. As parents, it's our responsibility to live with an awareness of time and learn to leverage the time. Children rarely think about time. This is why we're the ones saying, it's time to get to your job. It's time to get to sports. It's time to get up. It's time to go to bed. You've spent too much time on your phone. You've spent too much time on video games. As parents, we're the ones living with an awareness of time. Uh, David, the second king of Israel, has a journal, and he writes in his journal this prayer regarding time. Here's what David prays. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days. Teach us to remember that time isn't going to last forever. Teach us to maximize. Teach us to leverage the time that we have with our kids. Years ago, I saw an illustration that impacted me in such a powerful way that my wife and I, we went out and we bought three jars. Now, I only have two here today, but we went out and we bought three jars. And, and the big idea uh, behind the jars is we filled each of them with 936 marbles. And that's because from the time they're born to the time they are 18 years old, uh, there are uh, 936 weeks, okay, roughly. And so what would happen is you, we filled each of the jars with 936 marbles, and then based on the age of our kids at the time, then Caitlin was like, my oldest was in first grade, and then my uh, daughter Alyssa was right behind her in kindergarten. But um, what we did is when, when Caitlin came in, we counted up all the weeks she had already been with us, and we took out those marbles. And then the same with Alyssa. And by the time Jaden came around, we, it would literally start at 936. And then every week, we just take out one marble. As you can imagine, there's some weeks, a really good week. It's just kind of emotional. And then there were other weeks. It was like, dear God, I'm taking a fistful of these things. Get out of my house. <laughs> right? My son Jaden just turned 18 years old, but there are 13 weeks he's left with me before he graduates high school this year. That's it. You can imagine, I cannot microwave my parenting at this point. I can't do a cr crash course. I can't cram. Time doesn't last forever. And so we need to pay attention to the time we have and learn to leverage it. And, and the best way to leverage our time is just to spend time with them, hanging out with them without a real agenda, doing what they want to do, which isn't easy because we all have things we want to do. Oh, I want to go to the football game. I want to do this. I want. But what did they want to do? And the temptation, especially early on, as I did this as a parent, um, is I would spend time with them wanting not only to do what I want to do, but then I would try to teach them values every time we hung out. And the big value I cared about from very early on was work ethic. I was like, if this economy crashes, you know, if you have a good work ethic, you'll always have a job. Just mark my words, you know. It's like a like 90-year-old man in this young body. And it's just like, I cared so much about work ethic because that was taught to me when I was growing up. And, but here's the deal. Yes, values need to be taught. Work ethic, discipline, respect, how to manage money, all those things are great. But at the end of the day, parents 
need to start by communicating who they value before what they value. And with my kids and your kids, we want to communicate, ultimately we value you. And we do that by spending time with them. Now, every week I stand up here and give you stories of how I failed as a husband or as a parent at some point. There are some things I did do right and I have no regrets over. One of the things that I have no regrets over is ever since my kids were little, I would bring them each individually on a vacation every single year. Most of the time, it was just an overnight vacation, just one day. But for 15 years, I was guest speaking at Timberlake Church before I was the lead pastor. And so often, I would, in the summer, I would speak back-to-back weekends. And so on those times, I would bring one kid with me and we'd spend the whole week here. And we would go and we, we would, you know, do uh, driving and hiking together and stuff. And uh, I, I, I think that even as adult children, this is a, a healthy thing to do. But, but at the end of the day, we have to figure out how do I spend time with my kids? Now, I'm gonna tell you, I wasn't super dad. I wasn't, you know, some of you are super mom, super dad. You're like, oh, any opportunity I have to spend time with my kids, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. Others of us, it doesn't come natural for. So we have to discipline ourselves. And then there are some of you who you would love to spend more time with your kids, but based on your work schedule, based on uh, maybe you're in the military and you get deployed, based on maybe um, custody issues, you don't get to spend nearly the time you want to with them. And so uh, something encouraging to hear is this, that, that it's just small amounts of time invested over extended periods of time that produces results. Eat healthy for a couple days, it doesn't do much. You do it for a while, you start having more energy, you start losing weight. You study, you cram for a test, you might pass the test, but it really doesn't grow your, your mind and your intellect that much, but you do that all the time and you start to grow in your, in your uh, knowledge and the information you know. Small amounts of time invested over an extended period of time is what produces results. So the first supply every parent needs to carry with them is a watch. The second supply that every parent needs to carry with them is a compass. Children constantly need, teenagers constantly need someone to point them in the right direction, to help them develop morals and ethics, to say that's the path to go on. Now this is different than pushing them to excel in every area of life. Your child's grade point average is important, no doubt about it. But nobody ever in my adult life has ever asked me what my grade point average was in high school or college. Full disclosure, when the board of directors of Timberlake Church was interviewing me, not one of them asked me what my GPA was in high school or college. And now if they asked me, I'd be like, too late, sucker! Whatever sport your child plays is a big deal. But nobody has ever asked me in my adult life what team I ever played on or if I was ever in a team that made it to state. Now, to be fair, maybe they looked at me and said, that dude is not athletic. We're not asking him any athletic questions, right? But when it comes to pointing our kids in the right direction, we have to consider what matters most when they're adults. And if I asked you what matters most, I'm guessing your answer would be along the lines of this. What matters most when our kids are adults is their faith, their character, and their relationships. Because their faith, what they believe about God, impacts every area of their life. Their character will impact whether or not they keep a job, right? How they navigate relationships is a big deal. Ultimately, this is what matters. And when I wrote this out, I thought, this is an entire series. I'm packing so much into today. I'd love to do a series just on this, but this is our North Star when it comes to parenting. And I know that there are some parents who feel uncomfortable when it comes to specifically the faith issue. And they're like, well, I, I just don't want to push my kids in their faith. Let me give you a wake-up call. There are belief systems being pushed on your kids every single day. Amen. They are constantly being indoctrinated with all sorts of philosophies. It is actually irresponsible for us to be passive when it comes to building their faith. If we believe that our God is the God of all creation, the God of this world, if we believe that Jesus was God in the flesh, died to forgive sins once and for all, like, we truly believe this, we'd be irresponsible to not pass it on to our kids. So if you're new around here, I, I've been the, the lead pastor for five months. Prior to that, I was pastor in a church for 15 years in Kenosha, Wisconsin, where my wife and I had started a church early on in, in our church's history. Had a mama come up to me and she says, hey Dave, she goes, uh, I have two 16-year-old boys. They're twins, not identical, but they're twins. And uh, she said, um, I don't ever require them to go be part of church because I don't want to force God on them and I don't want them turned off to God. 
I said, all right, well, sounds like they're already turned off to God. They're not showing up. I said, but here's the deal. They're 16. How about as long as they live in your house, whether that's 18 or 20, 22, just say in our house, this is what we do. Give them at least a fair chance to reject God. And I hope that they have such a healthy experience with God. And I feel this way at Timberlake. May they have such a healthy experience that they don't ever deconstruct from what they learned at this church. That's my prayer. That's my desire. So next week she shows up. She's got her two 16-year-old boys there. And uh, they say, Pastor, did you make, did you tell my mom to make us go to church? I said, no, no, I did not. I said, I would if I was your mama, but uh, I did not. And so they started showing up week after week with her. And then they started getting involved. And when I left five months ago, they were still actively involved. And today they're actually on the website of the church. And one of them's a tech director. The other's a music director. They have full-time jobs even outside of this, but they're that heavily involved. Now, our goal isn't to get everybody on a website of a church, but I'm telling you, that happens by a parent caring about the faith of their kids. And what matters most is their faith, their character, and their relationships. And I'm gonna give you something to think about that quite honestly is a little bit you know, challenging to think about, but what often irritates us with our children when they're younger, when they're 10 years old, 11 years old, often is the very thing we want in them when they're 30 years old. That stubborn, strong-willed child that you have no control over, at 30 years old, it's possible they're considered a person of conviction. My daughter, Caitlin, when she was 15 years old, went through a huge stage of rebellion that lasted eh, about 10 years. Uh, so uh, it lasted a long time. And uh, I remember looking at her on a regular basis when I was so frustrated, and I would say, Caitlin, you are going to be a leader someday in a different type of way. You have a strong personality. God's going to use that, no doubt about it. But right now, I'm the parent, and I need you to help. I need your help in, in following this. And sure enough, today, she, she, every job she's had, she moves up the, the, the chain of command, and she's, she, call, she calls herself a girl boss, and she, she likes that, right? Uh, Seven-year-old who cannot sit still for more than a minute and a half, it's possible they will grow up to be a multitasking executive. The kid who's always starting projects and doing new things, never picking up after themselves. Sounds like they could be an entrepreneur, right? The kid who always pushes boundaries, and potentially, they're going to be a great employee at a startup someday. One of the goals of parenting is to raise mature and responsible adults, which means ultimately, all those other things matter, but ultimately, we want to focus on their faith, their character, and their relationships. And again, I've done so many things wrong. One thing I did right, I just talked about the individual vacations, but one of the things I did right, I have no regrets, is when my kids were teenagers, I would ask them, what adult friends of mine do you like love? Like you love being around them, they're fun, they're engaging. And when they would give me their names, I would then go talk to that adult and say, hey, will you spend time with my teenager? Will you bring them out, you know, grab a coffee or go out to lunch? I'll pay for it, it doesn't matter. And every time they're like, of course I would do that. I would love to. I said, because my, my kid loves being around you. And throughout their teenage years, they, they, they did, if, if my 25-year-old daughter, Caitlin, who lives in Milwaukee right now, if she went off the rails, I promise you, the ladies who invest in her, because there's more than just one, the ladies who invest in her, if I called them up and said, all right, she's going off the rails, they'd get in a car, they'd drive up, and, and Caitlin would still respect them. King Solomon explains the power of this when he writes these words. He says, without wise leadership, a nation falls. There is safety in having many advisors. So I wanted to surround my kids with as many advisors as possible so that if they went down the wrong path, they would have people pointing them in the right direction. This is why at Timberlake, we put so many resources into our children and student programs. We want to have positive influence in their life. We want to partner with you in echoing the values and behaviors you're trying to instill in your child. And together, we are placing an anchor in our children's hearts and in our students' hearts so they don't drift too far from God. When you give generously at Timberlake Church, I want you to know, man, we not only are providing resources, but staffing that helps them. And then we've got so many of you who volunteer. And by the way, when you drop them off, I know it looks like, oh, it just looks like, yeah, I have a good time and everything's a fun environment. It looks like one big arcade. And I promise you, Lance, Pastor Lance alluded to this last week uh, when he says, we give them what they want so that we have the opportunity to give them what they need. And I'm telling you, we believe they need Jesus. And so even at a young age, we're pointing them to Jesus. We're not babysitting them. And some people would argue, well, I think they're a little too young to really understand about Jesus. I'm gonna tell you, your kids, my kids, have heard and seen and experienced some pretty traumatic things in their life. 
they're capable of learning and understanding about Jesus. Last week, I spoke to our high school kids here at our Redmond campus. Why? Because I want to build a bridge to them. I want the opportunity to speak in their life. We have amazing staff. I still want that opportunity. I want to impact the next generation. Now, I'm not prepared to speak to our preschoolers anytime soon, but I will. <laughs> a great opportunity, right? And just as a side note, man, it's very common in churches, and I appreciate this. I'm not downplaying this. In, in churches like ours, it's very common for women to be involved in children and students' lives, and that's important. We need that. But I've noticed an extraordinary amount of men who are involved. And we need that as well. And I'm proud of this church for the impact we're having with both men and women speaking to our kids. So we need to carry a watch, a compass, and we need to carry a light. Light illuminates, right? Light helps us see things that we wouldn't normally see. The reason we have headlights on our cars is to see the path in front of us. The reason a surgeon has lights in surgery is to see every detail. If I'm about to have surgery and my surgeon says, yeah, turn off the lights. I want some mood lighting, some music, some candle. Here we go. I'm like, oh, no, nope, nope, nope. When our kids are going through dark days or stumbling around or can't see clearly, they desperately need light. And if you haven't figured it out yet, social media programs are not a good light or platforms, right? The government is not a good light. Our school districts are not a good light. We love those things, we appreciate those things, we need those things. I'm not downplaying them, but they have limited perspective. We need a brighter light. And on one occasion, when Jesus was speaking to a crowd of people, he said this, he says, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Light exposes darkness. It helps you see things you wouldn't normally see. And if our kids go down the wrong path in life, which is very, very strong potential there, what they need to be able to do is turn around and see the light of Jesus illuminating in us. That doesn't mean we're perfect. That doesn't mean we got our act together in every area. It just means that as Jesus is shining a light in our, in our life, whether it's in our anger and we're seeing things that we didn't, we didn't see the greed, we didn't see the self-centeredness, we didn't see the pride, whatever Jesus is shining the light on, that we're dealing with it and addressing it. It's important that when our children or students are going down the wrong path and they turn around, that they see Jesus in us and they're able to find the way back because they see Jesus in us. So I'm gonna wrap up with a story that, I warned you at the start today is a very heavy story. And if you have children, I'm just warning you one more time. Years ago, there was an MMA fighter by the name of Jens Pulver, known as Little Evil. Uh, Grew up less than an hour away from here. Started fighting in the late 90s. Uh, He trained and fought really hard for a few years before he finally won uh, won a belt for his weight class. And then in 2001, he becomes the very first UFC lightweight champion. This is a big deal. Here he is, grown man, world champion. He had initial interviews immediately when he wins, but then later on, someone hands him a mic to get his reaction. And he looks at the mic and he holds it and he just starts to cry. He gets very emotional. And through just being choked up, he echoes and he he says something to the effect of, see dad, I did amount to something. When Jens was 15 years old, he had such a horrible relationship with his father that he made a promise to himself that someday he was gonna be famous and he was gonna make sure everybody knew how evil his father was. So here he is, grown man, and every day he steps into the ring and he ends up putting his dad's face on his uh, opponent's body. And he goes to war with his alcoholic and abusive father. And and this is where the heavy story comes in. I read the autobiography uh, that Jens wrote. And at the very start, I mean, very first chapter, he tells this horrific story of the day that his dad uh, came into the house and said, I'm done with having kids. Lined up Jens and his two brothers in front of the fireplace and said, I'm gonna execute you. And then he takes a shotgun out of the closet and he puts a shotgun in Jen's his mouth. And Jen says, I, I literally peed my pants right there. And his father says to him, I pulled the trigger, but I don't think you're worth the cost of the bullet. And Jen says, I will never forget his words. 
even in my happiest moments. I, Jen's pulver, wasn't worth the bullets. It's possible that you had a parent communicate to you, you're not worth my time. You're not worth my energy. You're not worth my emotions. You're not worth the money. It's possible you had a parent communicate that to you. You don't have to repeat that pattern. I, I've read uh, that Jen has become a follower of Jesus, has found healing. I don't know all the details and how, how much of that story, you know, I, I can follow. But I tell you that story because it's so important for us to understand this. The unresolved issues in our heart will eventually make their way out in our parenting. The self-centeredness, the pride, the jealousy, right? Even things that I, I, I don't think can necessarily be helped without the proper medication or maybe... Uh, working through it with a therapist, things like mental health, like maybe daddy issues we have. That stuff, if it's not dealt with in some way, it's gonna make its way out. So we have to let Jesus shine a light on these areas and say, all right, I surrender. Imagine how different Jen's story could have been if his dad would have just said, all right, Jesus, expose the darkness in my heart, expose the issues in which I'm just uh, in need to address, and then he would have acknowledged his brokenness, his dysfunction, and cooperated with what Jesus wanted to do. Uh, imagine for some of you how your story would have been so different if your mom or your dad, if your grandparents would have addressed the issues in their heart, the lying, the lust, the entitlement, the greed, the selfishness, the cynicism, the addiction, whatever it was. How could it change your life? So here's the deal. Whether or not you're, you're a parent today, Jesus is always trying to illuminate our hearts and calling us to a better life. The disciple Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, he, he writes to followers of Jesus 2,000 years ago and he makes it clear. He says to them, God has called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. And every time we allow Jesus to illuminate something in our hearts, every time we choose to surrender an unresolved issue, every time we create more space for Jesus in our life, we become more and more filled with his light. And the more filled we are, the better we reflect the compassion and the grace and the mercy and the love of God. And we're never gonna be perfect, right? We're obviously flawed, but we become better and better the more Jesus has space in our life. If you had a terrible upbringing or you've had lots of failures that you can point to as a parent, I'm telling you, God wants to extend his grace to you. Addiction might run in your family, but it can stop with you. Divorce might run in your family, but it can stop with you. Alcoholism might run in your family, it can stop with you. Cheating might run in your family, it can stop with you. Racism might run in your family, it can stop with you. Suicide might run in your family, it can stop with you. Gossip might run in your family, it can stop with you. By God's grace, the course of your family tree can be redirected. Now, a little bit of my tension today in speaking to parents is I know that for some of us, it's almost as if the issue is not with us trying to build better kids, but it's like almost we have to be used to build better parents. And we're the kid, and it's like, man, I feel like I've been the parent to, to my parent, right? And, and that's a whole different message for a whole different day. And I, I just don't want to, to wrap up without at least acknowledging that, but here's Here's what I want you to know. There are endless problems plaguing our children and students today. Suicide, depression, insecurity, addiction. The list is endless. You cannot tax enough people. You cannot arm enough police officers. You cannot build enough jails. You cannot hand out enough prescriptions to fix everything that's wrong. But what we can do is take responsibility for our children and do our best to build their faith, their character, and relationships by carrying. Hey, watch compass and a light and it starts with acknowledging I cannot do this on my own so I'm going to wrap up and I'm going to pray for our children but I also want to give you an opportunity to surrender your life to Jesus if you've never done that let today be the day that you decide and redirect the course of your family tree that's what happened to my dad grew up in an abusive alcoholic family was in foster care the whole works and decided one day I'm going to redirect the course of my family and surrender his life to Jesus I want to give you that opportunity and if you decide to be a follower of Jesus today, I'm gonna ask that uh, on the connection card that looks like this, uh, that should be in the seats around you, that can be on the tables as you come in, that you would put your name in there, just give us some basic information, what you feel comfortable, and then check that box that says, uh, I'm, making, I'm committing my life to Jesus for the first time. Because what we wanna do is send you and resource you with a box that we've recently put together uh, with different resources that we feel will be helpful to you on that spiritual journey. 
And if you're like, I can't find the card, then go by our next steps table in the lobby and uh, just give them that information and we'll make sure that we, that we resource you appropriately. Would you stand with me? I'm gonna close in prayer. Our heavenly father, we thank you that you are a good and loving and caring and compassionate and kind father. We want to reflect you in our parenting. But admittedly, we don't always get it right. We drop the ball. We've got dysfunction in all of our families. So we ask that your Holy Spirit would empower us to be good parents. For those of us with children who've kind of gone down the wrong path, children who maybe aren't reflecting the values we've taught them, Lord, I pray that you, by your Holy Spirit, would begin to draw our children back to you. And for those today who for the very first time say, I'm surrendering, I'm stepping off the throne of my life, I choose to relinquish control of my life to Jesus. I pray that today would be a marked day and that you would honor that decision by your Holy Spirit doing a work in and through individuals as they surrender to you and helping us not only in our parenting, but helping us as followers of you to reflect you wherever we go. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching. But before you go, please be sure to bookmark this page so you can find us again next week. And are you looking for a way to get engaged and join a team? The online chat engagement team is a role that anyone and everyone can do. And it's simple. Engage with people. Create an environment where people are free to be themselves and more importantly, open to receive the truth of Jesus. And if you're interested in joining this team and becoming part of what God is doing through Timberlake Online, please let me know on your connection card. Links can be found in chat and I'll see you here next week at online.timberlakechurch.com.